Welcome everybody to the Learn Full Show. Every week we talk to scientists, experts, artists, leaders, uh, you know, every week and uh, from around the world. And today we're joined with Jim Cantrell, who's been on the show a couple of times and people should be familiar with him. He's the founder of Phantom Space, 20 years experience in uh, the space industry and is writing a new book called Breaking All the Rules, which I've read and I recommend everyone check it out when it comes out. Um, seriously, it's like a 10 out of 10. This is a very well written book. Um, uh, Jim, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks. Glad to be here. When will the when will the book come out? Just for people listening in. So we're in the final editing phase, and it will go straight up to Amazon as soon as that's done um, on the electronic format, and then it'll be uh, available in print a few weeks later. So I, I have been saying this month for months, but you know I'm going to say in March. I, I think it's definitely going to happen in March. Sweet. And then uh, people can check it out. Are there pre orders? Scott can add it to the show notes. Uh, no, we haven't, uh, we haven't, uh, done any of the pre order So, because it'll come out in, uh, electronic, uh, you know, Kindle okay. format first, you know, that'll be the easiest way we're working on an audible book as well. Uh, that'll take a little bit longer to, to get published and all that stuff. But, uh, yeah, I've even had, uh, you know, movie interest in this thing already. So, mm. uh, it, it should That'd be, be cool. interesting where it goes. Yeah. Uh, we were, we were just talking off the air about the, the Pez Pez the outlaw, the Pez outlaw, and then uh, the Pepsi owe me a, 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 a jet. I could see it like a little mini series like that, where it's like it's got like the fun to it, but also has like the serious tones too. I, I don't know who who makes those things, but they like I could see it as like a really cool mini series versus like a movie, because yeah. uh, you can just get you can do a little bit more. I don't know if you're a fan of of uh, like the the Last of Us or any of the new uh, mini series that are coming out. Yeah. Yeah, those are those are great uh, ways to get a story out there, you know. And I guess the production cost is quite a bit lower than like these big uh, big movies that we used to go watch. And uh, I Netflix has revolutionized the way that content's brought to people. And I'm always amazed when I go on there to see the kind of stuff that's out there. It's you know just so much of it you can't keep up with it. Mm -hmm. The uh, are you going to do the audiobook? Because you have a really good voice. I I. I I think it would sound pretty good, but then it's like you have, you know, only so many hours in the day. <laughs> no, I could, I could probably, you know, do it, but uh, we, we haven't got to the point of, you know, who, whose voice we should do it. Some people suggested to me I should do it, so you're not the not the first one. And so open to it. We'll see what my publicist says. He, he and I speak frequently these days. I think the reason why people like it when it's in your voice, it just adds a little nuance to it. Like, you know what to emphasize in terms of words like someone else reading it kind of can read it flat um i think that's the only uh, negative but then if you get someone good enough like if you get like uh what's his name it's not david gordon gordon that's who he is in bones uh stephen fry he he yeah. really acts when he does his audiobooks like for other people job. too yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. you could also uh i don't know if you if you got someone like similar to your voice that'd probably be cool too so if you got like the guy if you um and the, there's a game that's now a mini series called the last of us the guy, the guy who does the voice is such a raspy voice. It's like, it's like your voice, uh, but like even like a little bit more, raspy. I think it would like make a good, like it's similarly enough, like it's close enough, but it would yeah. be really good. Yeah. I don't know how you get the guy though. <laughs> It'd be pretty expensive probably. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, when you find, you find out when you uh, put together a, an audible book, you know, not only you have to pay the person, but if they're famous enough, then they get part of the royalties out of it. So mm. not, not that I'm doing this to make money, but. You know that it, it, this whole this whole publishing business is a totally different racket than I'm used to. You know, there's all the scammers out there, and the you know the the, the people, the middlemen that make money off of pretty much doing nothing, and then the then the people that really make connections and so on. So you gotta you know you get into this new world, and you you start to realize that hey, there's a whole other reality out there that people have been dealing with for centuries now. Yeah, I don't know how uh, to navigate. I know some people that are trying to publish but i look at i've talked i've had people on who are publishers i don't know if they've been on the record or not or the episodes are up but the publishers the agents and stuff and like the traditional publishing publishing it's like if you're a known person like you they do some work but for like new people it's like all they do is really just make the book like they they bind it but then amazon will do that for like five bucks a book or something like that like right. you don't really yeah. but then they take 30 percent and all these other things is Yes, yeah, really self-publishing is is coming into its own. I mean, it's had a bad reputation uh, that that you know it was people who couldn't get published otherwise. But you know, it's really ultimately a capitalistic way to do it. I mean, let the market sort it out. You know, the the difference is 
that the the better known authors get better marketing and, and exposure to the public. And uh, you know, uh, you know, the the Martian, for example, was a self published book. The the one the book that became the movie. Andy Weir wrote that. And I knew Andy back, you know, when he was a young guy. And uh, you know, somebody found it and thought it was great, and and then turned it into a, a script and a movie. And now no, nobody sees Andy at the space conferences anymore. Hmm. That's that's uh, that's sad to hear. The because I I think. Um... I originally read it when it was just like, like a web novel where he was doing chapter by chapter, which is yeah. one of the reasons why he was able to be like, you never wanted to stop. Cause he would like people like clicked off or whatever. He would like re-edit or something. So it'd be really snappy, but yeah. Uh, maybe he was just, like, he gets, you know, he gets hoarded too much. Like when he goes to the conferences or something, people just start like descending upon him. Yeah. I, you know, not, not that I'm the equivalent of Andy, but uh, I don't like to go to conferences because I, I can't make it from one end of the building to the next without just, you know, people saying, Hey, you know, I'm, Honestly, I like about half the people I meet, you know, because, <laughs> um, you know, I've been in business development most of my career and you have to like everybody you meet, you know, and you don't necessarily really like them. So it tends to be, uh, tends to be really dragging on your, on your energy to go to these conferences. So I don't, I, I, I become a conference recluse. So I understand why Andy doesn't do that. Yeah. The, uh, with some of that uh, was struck me in your book, it's almost so when I when I read about Carl Sagan, who's also mentioned a lot in your book, and uh, I, I can tell you're a big fan, and Carl Sagan, when you're reading about you know his life's his life, he would just like show up, need help people with something. He's always just somewhere. He's like that. Yeah. He's like that. Where's Waldo guy? That's just in everything. And you're yeah. kind of it, it. It felt like you were kind of like that for the space industry. You're just like constantly uh, like doing all these different things, and not not in like oh you're here for a moment, but like you're like actually like involved in and so many yeah. different uh, stories that we're going to get into, but th that was, a, that was a, like, you, you just like, as a, as a simile that I think you would appreciate. It's like, it, it felt, felt like you're kind of like the Carl Sagan of the space industry and that you, you can, you really do get to see all of it. Like, I don't know how many, I don't know if there are many aspects of the last, the whole space industry that you don't know about, you know, like in, in terms of that you can write in depth on it. Like it, it seems like yeah. either if you didn't know it firsthand, you know, the people secondhand and you can kind of like separate fact from fiction. It's like, a real life documentary and something that everyone should really enjoy. Yeah, that's a funny comment. So yes, Carl, in fact, came into my life like that. You know, I worked with the Planetary Society early on, which he was one of the founders of. But <clears throat> as I described in the book, I'm at home in my at my home in uh, Toulouse, France, one night, and this very familiar voice shows up on the on the uh, telephone. In fact, if I had to choose a voice, it'd be Carl's. Right? I thought his was one of the best. <laughs> voices out there but you know he just showed up and he says hey i'd like to see what you're doing you know who's going to say no to that but uh yeah i i, I think I, sh I i i like your uh description of the carl sagan of the space world better than mine which is the uh, forrest gump of the space world you know i kind of feel <laughs> that's what i've told people you know you're right it, it's and this is kind of what i've tried to write about is that there there's this story behind what we see with spacex and with this this modern commercialization of what well, they call it new space of of the space industry and it really comes down to a couple of groups of people that you know I, I i call them rogue intellects in some ways they they you know that's why it's called breaking all the rules these are people that just said look you know we're pirates and we're just going to get this done that we think needs to be done we don't want to care about the rules we're just going to do what do it how we need to do it and uh that that's the story i'm telling and uh, I go back into a little bit of my own, you know, personal background, because I think as I've discussed this over the years with people, they're interested as to why I got interested in this whole business. And I came from very ordinary circumstances. And that was, I think, one of the things that surprises people. It was this serendipity that kept happening over and over in my life. And it, and it still happens to this day. I, I'm just shocked. But one of the one of the things I like to tell people is that you need to be prepared to be lucky in life. And I think a lot of people have luck come by them and, and it's, it's just like, just right over their nose. They, they, they don't recognize it. And uh, you know, I've had billion dollar fortunes. I've stepped over many times, you know, one of the guys when I was in uh, high school that uh, was uh, uh, in, in the junior achievement group that I, I was you know, looking at joining was an early Apple employee that worked under Steve Wozniak, you know, and 
I didn't want to have anything to do with that. I, sh- I should have, but you know, my probably would have changed the trajectory of my life. But it's stuff like that that happens, right? And most of us don't pick up on it for whatever reason. You know, I've got an angel on my shoulder or whatever that that sort of tweaks me when when something like that happens, and I've been able to, you know, be involved. So yeah, I've 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 been in the space industry for thirty five years, and I've been involved in a lot of stuff, everywhere from planetary missions to, uh, and, and in fact, a lot of the modern NASA planetary missions I've had my finger in on on the source selection side for NASA. To you know, when I was a consultant, it was kind of like the equivalent of a of a of a, um, a, a fruit fly. You know, they they study those for genetics because their life cycle is so short that you you get a lot of different cycles when you study a, a, a fruit fly's life over, you know, a population of over a year. That's kind of how consulting is, right? You, you get your finger in a lot of things, not very deep, but enough that you kind of see how these things all stick together. And having done that for, I guess, a good 15 years, you know, that that was the other side of it. You know, I worked for everybody and saw most everything that was out there. And, and uh, some of it I can't talk about, a lot of it I can. And, uh, yeah, so that's what the book's about is, you know, how does this all come together? You know, what what how did really the forces come together to make Elon's efforts and his interest be able to 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 happen? It wasn't just that Elon, to the force of his own personality and his money, made it happen. There had to be a lot of things that came before it. And he was the right place at the right time and the right person. And so this is why I think this is very historic, what he's doing. And uh, this is why I thought the story ought to be ought to be put into writing somewhere. Mm-hmm. I think um, talking about that serendipitousness, the, the there were like, I think when you were going to college, you were um, you were in a degree that didn't work for you. But then you had a friend who said, "Why are you Why aren't you doing mechanical engineering?" And they're like, "You would love this." So I think there's serendipity, but it's also like one part is you were open to hearing it. Like if someone if someone said to you. You know, you should go left versus right. And if you didn't feel like right, left was the right way, you would, you know, you just keep going right because you have a strong sense of what you want to be doing. Even if you don't know what you should be doing, I think I just get the sense from the writing that, like, you know who you are and you, you navigate accordingly. Then the other thing is, like, people know you well enough to offer you that suggestion. You know, it's like if someone was walking by and didn't know you, they couldn't offer that suggestion. So I think it's it's the serendipitousness of it. But you also it's like you're making friendships with, like, the with, with people and they get to know you and they're like, Hey, you know, you might like this other thing differently. And that, and then being open enough to like, go check it. I was like, you know, it actually makes, it does make sense. Cause I do play with cars and, and build them and, and do all these different things in my life. So it does make sense. So, um, I think sometimes we talk about missing, missing it. It's like, people aren't even open to seeing it. So you, right. I think that's something also that you, you get to see in this book. And like, sometimes I feel like when people talk about luck or in serendipity, it's like, Oh, well, this person's lucky to, you know, good for them. Um, but like, I, I believe like the harder you work, um, the luckier you get and you were putting the work in, like, it's not like you didn't have, like, it's not like you weren't working on cars. You weren't doing these things to develop your interests at like, the first time, like for some people, and I get these emails all the time, they want to do something big, but they haven't explored what big means to them. <laughs> and, um, right. you know, cause it, it depends on who they are. And I think that's, it's one, one, I really like that you added all the stuff about yourself because, um, like a lot of times, like, oh, I know what that feels like to be picked on. I know what it feels like to not know what you're doing. Like, I think a lot of people, I'm oh, seriously, guys, like read this book. He's not paying me to say these things. Like, I this is going to be this is a great book. Uh, this is really good. Uh, I think it does tell that story. And um, there's actually a, a question I wrote down because um, I mean, literally in this book, just to give you like a little, like you cause international incidents. <laughs> like, this you know, like me. just like. <laughs> yeah, you, just, you know, you know, regular Saturday. Um, so there was um, there's a quote I wrote down. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Uh, okay, the serendipitous sequence of events that led to the creation of Sp- SpaceX and Blue Origin. Like from the outside, it does seem like um, like lightning struck and outsprout, uh, outsprouted um, SpaceX and Blue Origin. But the the story that you're telling is like it, it took. It was like a like a Miyazaki film, like the Seven Samurai, where like all these different people, different uh, expertises, where they were the top one percent of top one percent of, top, of, of their skills, all came together. That's right. Yeah, like there was a there's a book called Titan, uh, which is about um, Rockefeller, and he at a certain point started he tried doing like this Elon Musk type stuff, where he would try and build sh- uh, hospitals or whatever, but then the people he would pick would just you know, they were like uh, snake oil salesmen. 
So there's like the, one thing like we said for Elon and is that he could tell like, you know, the gyms from the not, you know, the, the, the bad people out there. But I, I'm curious, definitely dive in more to this idea that um, what what needed to come together just for SpaceX to exist. And then um, I don't know that much about Blue Origin other than um, Bezos had enough money and then put money into it. I have some friends that work there and they said, like, <laughs> the last couple of years have not been the, the nicest there. That's that's yeah. like. My, the extent that I know about Blue Origin. Yeah, so so they, they come from a common root. And uh, really, the story of how that root came to be was a good part of the early, early part of the book. And there had to be a lot of things that happened, right? And, you know, there, there were people who tried this before Elon. Andrew Beal was the most notable, but not the only one. But Andrew was a banker out of Texas. And he spent a hundred million dollars trying to build the Beal rocket, and uh, he went bankrupt. Well, he he quit actually after he spent that money. That was pretty much his net worth, and uh, he he created the the uh, test site out of McGregor, Texas, that SpaceX now inhabits. But uh, you know that that created uh, sort of an awareness of how hard it was to actually build a, a rocket privately. Heretofore, you know, only nation states had built what amounts to ICBMs. You know, we we watch as nation states still struggle with it, you know, North Korea. You don't have to look very far to see in the news, you know, that well, they tested an ICBM, which is a satellite launcher basically in all all shapes and forms, uh, that it, you know, if it fails, it falls into the sea, it does this, it does that. You know, that all had to happen long before anybody like Elon Musk could come along and say, hey, we're gonna we're gonna improve on what's been done. And there had to be a lot of failures, and people had to learn from those failures, like with Beal, in order to advise Elon properly to, to avoid certain landmines, right? And uh, <clears throat> the other thing, as you mentioned, was to get the right kind of people together. And, and it, I'm going to tell you something that might be surprising to you, because right now, Elon's like one of the most popular people in the world, not necessarily loved, but the most popular, well-known people in the world. When I was first dealing with him, People in the aerospace industry considered him a charlatan, a liar, and a fake, a snake oil salesman in short. And so part of my job with him was to lend my credibility, because I had a lot of credibility with the people, to those that say, look, this guy's real. He wants to do this. Because there were a lot of people that would say they would want to do it, waste your time, and go away. So, you know, he, he, he was really not... Uh, equipped to do this on his own. It wasn't like he showed up and said, hey, everybody follow me. We had to have a bunch of people who were true believers who had the talent to do it. And those were the early parts of SpaceX. And that came from this early tran uh, this uh, planetary society efforts to essentially do citizen-based space because the planetary society came out of frustration of NASA in the 70s not doing anything. You know, once the shuttle got funded, that's all they got funded in NASA. They they shrank away from things. It was it was described once as the the Portuguese who who explored the world and then shrank away from it. And and uh you know, in in that respect, the planetary society was there to try and put pressure on NASA as a public advocacy group to get them to do things and what they found out and this was, you know, what was formed by Carl Sagan and and Lou Friedman and uh, Bruce Murray was that that NASA still resisted them, even though they'd go and apply political pressure to them and make them look like asses. So in the end, what, what the Planetary Society ended up doing was funding through donations of its of its members, my efforts in France to be part of a uh, Mars mission, albeit a Soviet mission to Mars with French uh, contributions, right? And I didn't ask, you know, whether whether I could do that permission in those days. I probably would have been told no. I just went and did it. Uh, which got me into certain mountains of trouble. But this is the kind of thinking that went into the early days of SpaceX. People have just said, well, we're pirates. You know, we're, we're mm -hmm. going to do what pirates do. We have a mission. And by God, we're going to do it by ever, whatever means we have to. Those people had to exist for Elon to be successful. And that was the the core of the people that that survived through the early days of SpaceX. And then make no doubt about it, SpaceX would not be what it is today had the space shuttle not been retired, right? And talk about serendipitous. If that shuttle hadn't been retired, 
SpaceX wouldn't have gotten the billions of dollars it got on the COTS program from NASA and, and had the money to develop the Falcon 9 and the, and the Dragon capsule. So the, these these stories are intertwined, right? And and you can you can see how they, they the history sort of bounces back and forth, oscillates, if you will, every decade or two. And uh, you know SpaceX is now on on the top of it, and NASA is worried about them being a predatory uh, uh, you know, single provider to them. And uh, you know we're we're in a totally different world. And that's all these other rocket companies are or uh, sprouting up and that'll be one of my next books I, i'm calling it the rocket wars which i'm gonna i'm gonna pick up where this book leaves off and tell tell the story about all of these these rocket companies and they're it's also very fascinating and interesting yeah um well it seems it seems a uh it's not for lack of just like to comment on like the um the nasa single uh provider thing like other people have tried they're just not delivering <laughs> it's like like i think uh like no one's really delivering. Like everyone's behind schedule, which because I think they were having Hard. even uh yeah they had well they had the the mentality I see the two different mentalities that one that was at SpaceX is that they would they would iterate and try, where like the other way was they they would like per, as far as I can tell they perfected on paper before they would build, and right. so they just it's this entirely different thing that you can try. But then at the same time if it's like if it's NASA and you're just blowing stuff all up all the time, people are saying, oh, you're blowing up taxpayer money. So maybe that's the reason why they're against it. But that's I'm exactly curious. Um, I'm curious. The, uh, so uh, uh, Blue Origin was before uh, Elon's company. Um, what made you choose? And I, I, if it was stated in the book, I, I, I don't remember it, but what made you choose Elon over uh, Bezos's company? Because like Elon didn't, he wasn't like a, you know, because you kind of like to, in some in some ways, like, Elon Musk, you and like everyone come together made that successful. Where um, if it was like you guys, and then all the funding of Bezos, like maybe you could have made it successful as long as he. he I don't know. Well, I'm just I'm not going to factual. I'm going to counter your assertion that Blue Origin hmm. the rocket company existed before SpaceX because he, back then Jeff had what what I referred to as the Friday afternoon space club, and I guess oh. before I got involved with it, it was done on the weekends and. Jeff's, you know, he was the, he's had an involvement in space since he was in college. He was uh, the president of the Students for Exploration and Development of Space, SEDS. So, I mean, this is nothing new for him, his interest. But as he got more successful with Amazon, he started to pay certain people uh, to advise him on what he might be able to do. So, you know, this was in the 2000, 2001 timeframe frame. And uh, so one of my colleagues, Tom Svitek, was one of the first people that started advising Jeff and uh, on this Friday afternoon space club format. And, uh, you know, he would invite people in. I, I, I went up and briefed Jeff on how you go from here to Mars, because part of my educational background is uh, astrodynamics. So he was interested in that. Um, what happened on the launch side was uh, my mentor, Jim French, uh, was was fired by SpaceX in the early days. He he, in fact, Elon made me fire him. He, he made a claim against him and said, "Hey, get rid of him." And so uh, Jim had worked on the Saturn V, and he was a legend. Still is a legend. He's still alive. He's still out there doing things. And uh, you know, Jim went to uh, Jeff, and that's where the uh, all the all the Blue Origin rocket stuff started. And and Jeff began to understand the same thing that Elon did, which was until you develop a transportation, all this other stuff is is really just uh, you know mental masturbation, if you want to use mm. the the phrase. And uh, so both both he and, and Elon were looking at the same sort of problem to solve. Jeff approached it in the way that he could, which was he has this gravy train called Amazon, and he has money that he can use from it. And so he hired what he thought were good, competent people. And to go do, go do good competent things. Unfortunately, I think this is my opinion that he hired too many NASA people who, exactly mm -hmm. as you uh, as you surmise, are get it right the first time and fly it. And NASA has to do that because, in, as you rightly say, they're using taxpayer money, and so that kind of risk is is different. You cannot take any any kind of risk in a public format like that. So it's 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 ironically going to waste more taxpayer money in the long run. But the perception is that, you know, NASA is doing the right thing if you don't have failures. So Elon comes along and he has the software model of understanding, hey, fail fast and learn from your failures. 
And he personally is willing to tolerate those failures. He, he told me in the beginning, I'll put $100 million on my own net worth into that. And that seems like a drop in the bucket today. You know, whereas Bezos is putting a billion dollars or more every year into his operation of his own personal money, right? He's the only investor there. Elon could go out and he could raise money from other investor. You know, the capital formation for him was easy. So those people also understood that you get high returns off of taking high risks. So many of those early SpaceX investors are billionaires now today. And, uh, you know, because they took high risks with Elon. And that's just the capitalism playing out. And, and you know, it's just, it's just very interesting to see that that Bezos and, and Blue Origin has been much slower to come around. I guess they're my the inside word I'm getting is they're they're getting pretty close to their first launch here. They just won a uh, NASA uh, task order on this uh, what we call venture class uh, mission. It's a it's a mission to Mars that, uh, that is going to be one of their first launches from Cape Canaveral. So you know I, I'm getting indications they're actually getting close to launch, but it's been. More money than I would spend, and a lot more time than I would spend waiting for it. But you know that fit Jeff's you know station in life at the time. Now he's out of Amazon and able to you know pay a little more attention to it. Yeah. So it so it sounds like the early days, even though it existed, it was just more like a like a club. It wasn't actually like they were building it. Um, no. And yeah, in the last couple of years, I can't cite sources. And I uh, but like it's like he left Amazon and he comes over to. Uh, Blue Origin, and he just starts yelling at everybody because Elon, Elon Musk is doing so much, and with uh, and he starts yelling at everyone. It's like, why is he faster? And uh, and apparently he made he's made like a small like a section of the company who's who has like the the mandate to act like uh, SpaceX, where they could blow stuff up and go fast. Um, uh, so they're they're like they're like trying to like infuse the culture slowly. I guess is what they're as he's like transitioned over as one. Like he was yelling at everybody, apparently, um, which I guess if you spent like, you know, I don't know, like five, six billion dollars and everyone's beating you and you, you can't even make engines for ULA or Vulcan or I forget who it is, but he can't make engines, or, I think. So it, it one seems of like. The thing, yeah, sorry. One, one of the things okay. that really uh, I think is the difference is accountability, right? So yeah. Blue Origin's only accountable to Jeff Bezos and not a, a bunch of other people. This is one thing I discovered when I sort of wean myself off of government money and, and add on to commercial money is when you have investors that are chewing your ass and they're all over you. And if you don't hit a milestone, they're, they're calling you at 11 o'clock on a Friday night, wondering why, you know, that's a different kind of pressure than if, you know, you got one guy and he's like, well, he's busy, you know, he's in he his, his family are taking the weekend mm -hmm. off. And it, it's a completely different uh, uh, motivation. So, that he's come in and he's asking for this and this accountability is great, but we'll see how effective it is. Bringing in, it, it, this is the beauty of capitalism, bringing in this outside capital formation and having the accountability associated with it tends to bring out the best in us, right? Whereas, you know, if it's one person, it tends to be more of a, frankly, it, it, it looks like a dictatorship, right? It's, it's another form of government sort of organization. So I'm not surprised that this has happened in that sense, because it's just a fundamentally different way to, to fund it. I think he would have been, had he brought in other investors out there, he himself would have been accountable to yeah. outside forces where he is not now. So if, you know, if Jeff Bezos says, look, I'm tired this year, I've got a divorce. I, I got a new girlfriend. I want to spend more time with her and work on my, on my buff body and all that sort of thing. You can do it, right? Who cares? It's his money. But, mm -hmm. you know, if you got investors, they're, they're going to say, Jeff, you know, get up. It's three in the morning. We, we want you to come out here and we're not going to lose this money, right? That's the big difference, I think. That's fair. I, I can see what you're saying, though. Because I've worked at places that had investors and some that were just bootstrapped. And it is a different thing. You can you can get a similar level of accountability with the, the mission. I think that, uh, that's, if you look at, like, it's a multi-variable thing. It's not like just one thing, of course. I think another thing that Elon has going for it is because he has had, and that's something you talk about in the book. Um, is it was the is the like his vision was outlandish, but it was like something about the way he he said it made it seem like because you get a lot of pitches in the book. You were talking about this, like people come to you all the time, and uh, they'll say, "I have this idea," but you, 
like some part of you, like either through your technical knowledge or just like assessing people, you know, like this is full shit. <laughs> but like something about the way uh, Elon came about, it was like it was big, but it was something that people could get behind at the same time. So they have the fact there's accountability. They have outside investors. They have the vision uh, where I mean, I, I like I was reading about, you know, the uh, Jeff Bezos company, I, I, like build weird rockets, build big rockets. Like, I don't know. Like that, that's all they're about. Like, I think the vision also helps people. It's I think in um, military terms, it's you like op- it's like battle doctrine, so that everyone yeah. knows what their operational details are within a certain scope. So it's like the the like the general can't tell the private like how to do his job, but he can set the conditions so everyone understands what the job is, and then they let them execute it. It seems that Elon Musk's company has that type that type of thing through the vision, through the accountability, and Jeff's really. I think they're starting to like what you're saying. I think they're starting to catch up and maybe starting to develop that, which is which is key. Um, I wanted to ask you about. Um, I was I've been looking at Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. I don't know if you're a fan of his his YouTube series. He re, he really breaks down uh, rockets and stuff. But I mean, for you, it's like you have, I know all these things. Um, he the, he recently had an interview with uh, Elon where he saw the new Raptors, and the Raptors were extremely simplified. The Raptor twos were really simplified. And I was looking at your rockets at Phantom, and rocket engines to be specific, and they had all the fiddly bits as Elon was calling it. And I, I was wondering, um, how w- when you look at the Raptor 2, does it inspire you to do the thing that Elon was talking about in the interview, which I'm, I'm going to paraphrase, which is like, if it doesn't, like, just delete it and see if it, if you need it, like how to streamline and stuff. Because yours looks a lot like Raptor 1. Like, it looks very similar. Once again, I'm not an engineer, but I'm just looking at it like, you know, uh, no, comparing contrast. Yeah. Yeah. So, so no, that, that is how these things get better. So that's the race car mentality. Is if it doesn't have a function, you strip it off because it weighs something, and it can come off and break and so on. So, so no, I subscribe to that. But in in, in terms of the stages of the rocket engine development, in the first stage, you have a lot of diagnostic equipment on it because engines, despite you know our computational abilities, our experience, and all these things, they're still kind of mysterious and they do things that you don't expect that you don't understand. So, in the beginning, you have a lot of instrumentation when you. When you look at our engines provided by Ursa Major, they're, these are former SpaceX engineers, by the way, and many mm-hmm. of them worked on Raptor. And, uh, you know, they, they applied sort of the same philosophy SpaceX had on developing, which was develop and, and test a lot. And, uh, for example, our engines have 50,000 seconds of, I think they're up to 60,000 now, of, of test time, right, which is, I think, more than, there was 1,000 seconds on the F1s on the, uh, on the, on the, uh, uh, moon rockets that went up so so quite a lot and uh you know all those wires and things and tubing and all that all that's just test stuff so as it becomes more operational you'll mm-hmm. see these things clean up quite a bit you see the same thing with um you know automobile engines as well uh some of the more modern uh engines uh are, are very clean compared to what you would see say in the 70s because as what happened is is during the 70s, it was starting in the late 60s, the, this 1940s technology, which sort of kept on going in the engines until the 60s and 70s, had to be adopted to new regulations for uh, smog reduction. And so the only way we could do this was adding things onto it on the outside. But as computational abilities got better and experience with the engines, it continued they got cleaner and and they, they today you look at a modern engine it's a fairly clean device run entirely by computers so so that's that's kind of the evolution of these things uh, and and Elon's right you know it's 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 just like race cars you did, you just strip it down to the bare essence of it but you you can't do that right up front because there's too much unknowns really mm-hmm. and uh that this is classic Elon by the way uh he he has He's always right, okay? He always is. And on, I learned a long time ago, if I ever argued with him, he was always right. But I was also right, but in a different context. And so classic Elon is he sees the end point, and he wants today to be the end point, and he wants to skip as much over the intermediate points that you need to get there, right? And uh, Falcon 1 was an example. That was a That was an intermediate point, how to build and launch rockets. It was a small one about the size of our Daytona. But it was, you know, nonetheless complex, and you learned all the launch ops. So they could not have done the Falcon Nine the way they did it without having gone through the Falcon One. So that's mm-hmm. that's 
the evolution of, of engineering things. That makes sense. Then um, I, I would think just in, in reading the book and getting to know you that you probably have a lot of fun working on the engine component, like the, the rocket <laughs> engine. If not just like the, I've been listening to the sounds. There's this new game ca- that came out called uh, Kerbal Space uh, Program 2. Oh. And they they had it. They added all. They had added all the sounds from actual rockets going off, and it's so enjoyable <laughs> to listen to them. It's like I don't know if you have it. Uh, like if I if I were you, I'd have like my rocket as my like my uh, ringtone or something. But um, I I would guess that like the the most fun you'd have would be on the engine. Um, but that'd be just my guess. Is there like a component of that if you could get in the weeds and, and work on it? Because you're more um, you're you're stuck more on like the business side of things. I think nowadays. Oh yeah. You don't get to do that yeah, in. I, I describe I describe your career in management with a with a rectangle, right? And it's got two lines through it. And you start at the top. The top triangle is 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 a, a, a work, and then the side triangles are travel, and then the bottom triangle is eating. And as you go mm-hmm. down through it, you know you go from work to work travel, and then at one point in your career, you're all travel, and then you start to just eat and travel, and then by the time you get to my part of the career you're just eating right and so you're not mm-hmm. doing any engineering or any traveling anymore you're just talking to people and selling an idea so you're right um and it turns out i'm good at raising money so that's what i do but you know i for just fun on the weekends like i've got a small block chevy i'm building to put in a car i'm doing it myself i could pay somebody to do it but i enjoy it right mm-hmm. they don't let me work on the rocket engine. it's probably a good thing because i'm not that experienced at rocket engines but yeah i i look at them i understand it i understand what's going on in it and uh you know i'm probably the one thing i that, that i they have let me do in the shop is I'm, i've been welding since i was 12 years old so i've welded a bunch of stuff up for the company in the early days right but that that's we make our tanks here and i i get out there and i every every day i'm there i look at see where they're at on the welding because we've got these robotic welding capabilities and it's just fascinating to me i learned a lot just watching it and learning a lot from the guys that you know how you put together these high precision structures you know with welding it's it's more than just laying a couple pieces of steel out there and and running an arc welder across it so it's it's been very interesting to me that way but uh yeah it's it, it, it 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 i i'm okay with getting to the point in life where i can't get my hands dirty you know with things like rockets because I, I still do it with cars so I, I do I do almost everything on the car from paint it to the engine work which keeps me sane yeah I think the uh, the asset of still having like you're you're having fun on the weekends with building something uh is that let's say there's a problem at phantom and and you know everyone needs to come on hand you can you can still put a hand in I think oh, yeah. sometimes when it's just like if it's just like a business like an MBA person, which I, I know Alan must hates, but uh, the if it's just an MBA person, they would be like, well, they just sit there like yelling at you, run faster. It's like that doesn't do anything. Like we're working. Like you actually can go in and do yeah. something. So it's, it's well, just yeah. an asset so too. A, a great example is valves. So valves on rockets are one of the biggest pains in the butt because people that make them are limited in in both what they what they've made, right? Uh, plus they only have so many people, so. So if you have a new application that has a slightly different valve requirement, it's not like you can go down to the hardware store and buy a rocket valve, right? They, mm-hmm. Because they're, they have to operate at cryogenic temperatures. They have to be fail safe. They have to have all these things. So in the early days, we decided we couldn't afford to build valves that they could meet our cost objectives for the vehicle. And so I said, okay, guys, we're going to get into the valve business. And uh, so I, I remembered a, a handbook on valve design that I had come across some 10 years earlier. So I went out and found it and they were out of print. So I got them on eBay and I bought four or five copies and I sent them to all my engineers and I, and this was during COVID. So I said, okay, we're having a zoom call on Tuesday, read up on, on the different kinds of valves. We're going to design the damn dump valve for this thing. And so we did, we, we spent a day and we're going, you know, through the valve design and, you know, we we're all suggesting, you know, what about this? And it'll seal this way. And we all brought our experiences in. You know, uh, I was, I, I'm a bit of a sort of an amateur metallurgist. So we talked about, you know, how the metals behave and some of the, some of the plastics and how they behave. And uh, the material side of it was something I understood very well. And others, you know, had the geometry and one guy had it up on cab. By the end of the day, we had the valve design. And it's the valve we use today for our, uh, our flight safety system. So even the FAA has approved that valve. It hasn't changed a whole lot from our early design. So it's, uh, yeah, that, that, see that, that was fun, right? I can still mm-hmm. get involved at that level. 
it, uh, do you have to, so you design it? Did you guys have to like 3D print or like test it to know it was good? Or did you know enough on paper to know it was going to work? Well, we, you know, we got to build prototypes and test them. And the yeah. first one didn't work, but it leaked. And then we discovered, mm. you know, we discovered certain things about the the sealing properties of, of aluminum at cold temperatures. And then we went to stainless and because we were having some problems with aluminum. And that's all these things because we never built, I've never built a valve before in my life. I was buying. So we were learning some of these things that aren't in the books. And, uh, you know, we would talk to people and they would give us tips and I think it took us four or five iterations before we got it to work and uh, the way we wanted, you know, with the leak proof and all that sort of thing. And sort of funny in the end, um, Ursa Major on their engines has enough valves that we didn't we didn't need this valve uh, as a main shut off on the fuel tank. So we moved it as a way to um, way to shut off the fuel uh, for flight safety. Right. So we didn't have a leakage uh, requirement mm-hmm. anymore. So all those things we worked so hard to fix, we, we actually in the end didn't really even need. Hmm. there's a in the tim dodd interview they showed that uh well they showed as much as you can through fuzzy stuff because i think it's like part of itar or something like you can't reveal too much uh right but like uh, a part of the starship stuff is they have like uh, dual welding on both sides of the thing and apparently it's like really difficult to do but it's like proprietary you can't like let the chinese know about it or anything do you your rockets are smaller but also giant i mean they're, they're size of buildings in terms of height um, do you guys have to do the similar thing or is it of a size where you can just do the, the hand type? I'm not a welder, as you can tell by what I'm saying, but like, I do know, like, like the, there's a unique special sauce and like being able to weld both sides and like roll weld it or something like, do you guys do something similar to that? So we don't need to, because the thickness of our material is small enough that, you know, mm. it, it just it penetrates all the way through. So, you know, when, when we do our welding, say on the tanks, for example, we just have to make sure that the, the weld penetration is, is proper and then we actually have to cool the backside of the weld so that the heat doesn't spread and cause the heat affected zones we call it to, to be larger than than what we want so there's like this balance and and so we spent a lot of time working with that and what will you know it's been cold in tucson recently and what we found was the the the, the outside temperature actually affects and the humidity affects this we had some arch stability problems with it so there's there's all sorts of just know how, right? In in making these things, you, you can get a drawing and and give it to somebody, and they won't necessarily be able to reproduce it because of all these these things like you're talking about. You know, know how on how to actually weld something, and uh, each and every one of these things comes down to people that have done the, you know running these problems and solved them before and done it. Uh, that that makes the difference. I when we get new engineers in. Um, sometimes they find me annoying because I, I take them out and introduce them into the, the technicians, right? So the technicians are the guys that have to build this thing. And I said, look, these guys are actually the designers of this rocket because they know how it's going to work and they will know what doesn't work. You're here to make sure that their ideas actually work, right? And to do the calculations to make sure that what they say is going to work well, because ultimately it comes down to people who've done it before. And uh, most of our engineers haven't done it before and they're fresh out of college so they're really just advisors to those who who have Mm -hmm. sounds like a a a very you know good process to do do the how long does it take the engineers to realize like it's valuable and do the buy-in themselves to like seek out that that knowledge on their own (laughs) yeah we 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 filter our guys you know we we (laughs) first of all we won't hire people that don't do stuff with their hands like Mm -hmm. as a as you know sort of a hobby or you know, or don't don't have a history. If they grew up on a farm, that's awesome because they, you got to fix everything on a farm. Uh, so, so we we really filter it for for those kind of people. We don't want, for lack of a better term, eggheads who, who've done nothing but study books. And that's great if you want to be a professor or you know do research and things like that. But we're building something, so we got to get people who are builders, makers, and doers. And uh, so, so they tend to learn this pretty quickly because they have had a lifetime of problem solving, which is all engineering is, by the way, is just how do you solve this problem? What's the most practical way to do it? Let's go implement it. And so, so you know, we find they, they learn pretty quick, our, our young engineers, and what they like about this environment that you don't get at, say, Raytheon or NASA or one of these big companies is we put them out there. They get to touch the hardware. They get to actually, you know, use tools. And, and I like to say, 
you know, some people are a menace to society with a screwdriver in their hand. We're hoping they're not. Um, I can tell you my young engineers tend to be the, uh, the, the least clean about their work environment. They tend to leave the tools hanging around. And of course, you know, leaving a tool in a rocket can be a really bad thing. Um, you know, the, the shuttle, when it used to launch, you open the bay doors and you see tools flying out sometimes, things like that. So, you know, keeping track of your stuff is very important in this environment. And they learn that, but, uh, no, nah, it, it's, you know, it's really not any different than almost any other industry. And you've just got to focus since we're, you know, we're, we're not here to design really cool, unique things. We're here to design a rocket that we can fly often and cheaply. And that's a different problem to solve than design the best rocket. You know, this is not about the best rocket at all. It's the most effective rocket given the right. parameters of the vision. Yeah. The, yeah. I definitely see your point on the science. I, I think of it this way, like when something's in your head, it's like, depending on who you are, it's like the least real version of what your thoughts are. And then you write it down and then it's a little bit more like if you if you have an idea and you write it down, you just read it back to yourself. Oh, that, that was actually pretty stupid. Like your mind can kind of like play tricks on yourself. So you write it down, it gets a little bit more real. But then if you build it, it's the most real, like it, it, it literally has a weight to it. And so That's like right. the more you can just on the timetables, like people who just stay from their head to their paper. And if that's their life, it's, it's fine. Like I, I, I have a lot of scientists on here and I, I understand that you have to do that or else like people get cancer and stuff. But um, when you may, when you bring from paper to real real life, like that transition from academia to startup where they have to do that, they something I've noticed is the the timetable doesn't get shifted. They're used to like an academics timetable. And it's really hard for them to, to it's usually like the investors that like I'm hearing a lot from the investors, like they have to like, all right, guys, like, you know, yeah. you're going to be out of money in like six months. You want to do something. And so uh, like that timetable is the biggest thing that changes because the it either changes, they die. I mean, it's like one of those like adapt right. things, but, but like when you, when you bring it from paper to real life, like that's when uh, for academics, like they have to like really pick that up. That's like, that, that's a really big, uh, uh, like filter, like, like a great filter in terms of like knowing who's going to make it and not just for the scientists. Like, um, that's how I think about it in terms of like the, the transitioning transitionary period. Um, the, I wanted to talk more, uh, like this is going to be a bit of a, like a transition because I know we're going to go back to talk about rockets in a bit too, but I want to talk more about your book and some of the things that I didn't know about. Um, so that's I wanted right. to, uh, so, so the, um, uh, there was like, there was like so many really cool, uh, details. Like, uh, when, when people think of you, you're like, you guys were here. Like your family was here since it's like Jamestown. Like how many people can say this? It's like so cool. Um, but uh, anyways, um, so you were talking about Snap On, and I think the quote was they're like heroin for mechanics. And it's like I didn't I, like growing up. I I think I used I, I, there's not Snap On anywhere that I was using, and you know maybe I, so I I I never heard of this thing that's like heroin for mechanics. So is it is it still that great, or is there something else that supplanted yeah. it? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. My my youngest daughter is a uh, chosen to be a mechanic. She dropped out of uh, engineering school, wants to work on cars, and she's discovered that the the Snap On man comes around in his truck. And uh, <clears throat> Snap On tools, not everybody agrees, but they're generally considered the best tools, and they're very expensive. So they've they've created this brand image that they're they're just for the best mechanics, right? And uh, of course, that's all I have is Snap-on tools because I've been collecting mm. it for 40 years now. And uh, so, so Snap-on it has competitors now. There's Matco. There's there's others like that that yeah, they no, all man. have these trucks. And you'll see them if you watch. You'll see these Snap-on trucks are still out there. Um, and Matco and these. Then they and they go from dealership to mechanic repair shop to place. And and they've got tools in the truck, right? And uh, these mechanics, most of them young, you know. 18 20 25 30 the older guys have, have seen it enough they, they don't buy anymore but they, they go in there and they see these shiny tools you got to have it you know it's it's like heroin and i always we used to joke and call him the heroin dealer don west was our was our snap-on dealer up there in logan utah where i was i, I was a mechanic working my way through college by the way so so that's how i paid my way and uh mm -hmm. this guy would show up and i was so in debt to him he would give credit to anybody right and he'd come collect, you know, out of your paycheck, you know, $30 every week or whatever it was, you know, and you wouldn't tell your wife or your girlfriend or your parents maybe that, you you know, some of your paychecks disappearing to these tools. And, uh, yeah, it was uh, still the same. I mean, everybody everybody does this. I, I still go online and, you know, there, there's, uh, there's, there's a tool 
company that I that I like that has everything in in these little cut out foam pieces that I'm still salivating mm-hmm. over. One complete set that's like twenty five thousand dollars, you know. So it tools are an addiction, and and it's a it's a funny thing. Yeah, there's a company that'll they have it's like a foam. It's like two inches thick, and there's layers to it. And so you put a tool on it, and you can cut into it and make custom for everything. And yep. I, I'm like, I really want to buy some, but I know if I do that, then I'm going to start buying a lot more tools and stuff and start tinkering oh, yeah. things, which is what I want to do in the spring anyway. But um, it's like or, organizing things is is a lot of fun. Is there um, I don't know, snap on sounds expensive, but uh, but is there are there like entry level tools for people who are working at home? I know like I didn't know about them. Is there Sears, Sears Craftsman was sort yeah, of the one? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. And they were always, you know, when Sears went out of business. They they license their craft craftsman tools out because that was probably the only good thing left out of Sears, mm-hmm. right? And uh, yeah, you know, I mean, if you go to go to Lowe's, they've got their own brand that's that's pretty good. And yeah, there, there's it, it used to be like in the seventies the the Chinese tools were just so crappy you couldn't even use them. But the Chinese stuff has gotten pretty good these days, and I think most of it's actually made in China. So uh, you know, some of some of the Germans make some of the better tools as well. Of course, they do. And, uh, you know, some of it's still made in the U.S., like Snap-on. Is there a... I know the Germans have that branding for making quality engineering. If you look at it, uh, I'm trying to think of an American-made engine that I know about um, and, like, compare the two. Like, is it really distinct when you look at the efficiency of, like, an American-made engine versus a German engine? When you look at it, like, you you know what you're looking at. I I feel like put things together. If you told me, like, if, if I, like, have YouTube and stuff, like, I did my breaks and stuff and, like, did, like, the brake line and whatnot, um, but, uh, which is really, was really hard to do because it was, like, 105 degrees out and I was in the middle of a parking garage and I only had, like, two tools and, like, <laughs> people kept coming. I was like, do you need help? It's like, no, it's all right. But anyways, um, is there, when you look at it, is there really that big of an efficiency? I mean, or is it, like, something that only the numbers, like, math, like, computers would know? No, there's a big difference between them. European sourced engines, Germans in particular. I mean, the Germans just have a way of doing things that's unusually good, right? When particularly when it comes to machinery, and but but if you look at the European environment versus the American environment, there, there's been fundamentally different forces that, that cause them to evolve differently. And uh, the Europeans, for example, you know, fuel efficiency was much more important, and so you you saw things like overhead camshafts instead of camshafts that are down in the engine block and uh you know things like that was showing up much much earlier than it did here in the u.s by and Mm -hmm. large you know the u.s was more concerned with inexpensive reliable horsepower right Uh, gas efficiency be damned because cost of fuel is quite different here so you see the cars in europe were originally much smaller and the engines are more efficient smaller displacement and and therefore a little bit higher tech we would consider Mm -hmm. you know more complex some of the reliability was was not so good, particularly on say the Italians and the English stuff. Uh, but but the German stuff was always really reliable, good good stuff, but expensive, right? So that was mm-hmm. the other side of it. So now what you start to see because you, you've got a lot of computer aided manufacturing that's come in, and and the ability to design these things with computer aided design tools has really leveled the playing field, and so you see a lot of. U.S.-based engines, for example, the new Corvette engines, I think they call it the LT4, is a dual overhead cam uh, uh, engine with a flat crank just like a Ferrari. It's 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 every bit as good as a Ferrari engine. I know the Ferrari Easties are out there having a meltdown, but I, I own a couple of Ferraris. I know what I'm talking about. These are good engines, right? So, so it, you know, it's becoming a lot more of a universal thing, I, I would say, in the last, you know, five to ten years. And I think going forward, we'll see, you know, the Americans have joined the rest of the world in terms of sophisticated uh, automobile engines, at least. Is there, um, just to circle back on the Snap-on, If is there a tool, they're probably pretty expansive with it, but if you could have them make a tool specifically for something for you, for an issue you're having, is there like, is there something that you tell them to make or they, do they make everything that you need? If you could say, uh, you could like uh, measure that CEO and say, "Hey, make this, make this thing a widget that'll do this." Yeah, I mean, it, it, the luxury of having somebody make a tool is generally not out there. We we make a lot of our own tools, so sometimes mm-hmm. they're you hack up, you know, cheaper wrenches and things like that and weld them together, and that's very common, right? But you know, there, there's there's all sorts of tools, and I I probably spend you know half of my free time 
shopping for tools because I, I love tools. And I'm, I'm always finding a tool that enables me to do something that I didn't know could be done, right? So that hmm. that's my fascination with it, and particularly metalworking. I, I love to do metalworking, whether it's sheet metal or, you know, steel or aluminum and, and, and machining and things like that. So that tends to be where my mind goes. But, you know, as far as like in wrenches and things like that, there, that one, you can pretty much buy whatever, whatever can be made has been made there. But, you know, the, the world of metalworking and, and specialized things like that, there's always something new out there. Yeah. I, um, when you're, when you're, I'm gonna have to like go to a, a, a cause I'm only, I only know like the Sears, uh, and Mac. So I'm definitely going to like, go check out snap on, but at the same time, it's like, do I want the heroin? You know, it's like, uh, uh it's apparently very addictive. It's just the, the actual heroin. And so it's like, you know what, uh, do I want to go down that line? But, um, when, when you talk about like people in the trucks going around. So I, I grew up in the country and, uh, growing up, I would see cartoons of ice cream trucks and stuff. And so I always thought it was made up, like when people drive like and do sales in that way or do ice cream in that way. But then I went, like, I, I started hanging out in town. So, like, oh, you guys can have an ice cream truck. Like, what? I haven't so deprived out here. <laughs> like, there's nothing out here anymore. Right. Um, right. But, uh, but I wanted to, uh, also your garage kind of sounds like, a um, what's his name? Iron Man's like, a, like you have all oh. these cars, you're working on all these different things. It kind of has like when in episode, the first one, when he has like the rows of cars. You just need like the Iron Man suit and you kind of like complete it. But it, if you talk about music in the book quite often, I like how important it is just, and I think we were talking off the, off the record about uh, how we jam out when we're working. But if this book could have a soundtrack, I don't know if you were writing with a soundtrack or if you'd, you could suggest a soundtrack for it, what would be the soundtrack for this book? Oh boy, it'd be eclectic, right? It would be everything yeah. from, from heavy metal. I'm a big heavy metal mm -hmm. fan. And, you know, particularly when you get into the racing chapters, when I drive, when I drive these race cars, I drive, you know, sometimes I'll play like, like, uh, I don't know, there's this Mexican metal band called Brujeria and you play that. And I'm like, this is what it feels like to drive the GT1 race cars. Right. It would go all the way from there to, uh, to classical, to, you know, to some country, to, you know, Motown. I was a huge Motown fan in the young days. And, uh, you know, it, for me, the music goes with the era, right? And I'll, I'll mm -hmm. hear a song today that takes me immediately back to a time in my life back in the 70s. And it's 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 amazing how that does. It's almost like smells do that too sometimes when you have you encounter an odor or a smell that, that reminds you of maybe your mother's baking or, you know, something like that. Music does that to me. And I'll mm -hmm. remember certain incidents in my life that I was listening to music when this happened. So, it, for me, it's a it's a big impression, and I, I listen to all sorts of music. I, I actually play the piano. I have since I was young, and uh, so I, I, I rather enjoy music. It's one of the one of the more important parts of my life, actually. Yeah, the uh, I I read Einstein's biography by Walter Isaacson, which I think is behind me uh, somewhere, and yeah. uh, he talked he talked about how uh, Einstein would use it when he when he was stuck on a problem, he'd start playing the violin, ah. and it would help him. Like, you know, because Einstein was very creative, like there were people who were better at math or, yeah. you know, the physics side of things, but it was just like how we can combine things, that creativity to let them do stuff. So now I picked up a violin and I'm totally learning it. And uh, we could probably start our own band. I, I don't know how many other people, you know, who play, <laughs> who play instruments. We could have like a little traveling band. That'd be pretty cool. Uh, yeah. But it'd be like, a, we could, we, it would be like Jim and the Jets because our right. like Jim and the Rockets or something. Yeah. Probably you know, go with something like heavy metal. Yeah. Um, and the, the Mexican band was... But, how would you spell their name? Because I'm gonna—I have never heard this before. Yeah, B R U J E R I A. Okay, that's pretty cool. All right, I'm gonna check that uh, out. For I this. Live Fifty miles from the border, so I, I'm into eclectic stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and then um, there was there was a funny story when you moved to I think Utah when you were a kid that uh, before you moved in they knew everything about you, and so I just wanted to know because this happened. You know, this is back like forever. You know, for the young people listening, this is before the internet existed. Like, the, how did they even know to look you up? Um, so I was just wondering, did you ever figure out how they knew everything about you? Did you ever like kind of tease out how they were able to like detect oh, you guys before? I, yeah, it was easy. So my stepfather went mm -hmm. up there to buy a house, and the realtor, uh, you know, asked him a lot of questions as he's driving him around. And of course, you know, all that information then gets put out on the on the gossip network. <laughs> so everybody in this little town of 600 people and it was called Menden, Utah that we moved into. And uh, the moment I moved in, everybody knew what religion I was. 
They knew what I liked to do. They knew where my family was from, you know, what school I was going to go to, what grade I was in, how old I was, all that stuff. Wow. It was spooky, actually, to me. Yeah. Yeah, it sounded spooky. I would be like, am I about to be eaten by a cult members or something? Like, are they going to descend <laughs> upon the house? Well, so, so like you said, there was no internet. So I, uh, you know, when, when my stepfather said, hey, we're moving to Utah, and I, I looked it up, and when I opened up the encyclopedia, because we didn't have an internet, so I, I was... I, I had my own encyclopedia set, and that was probably the best gift my mother ever gave me. That was our early Google, right? So I opened it up to the section on Utah, and it's got this picture of what they called handcart pioneers. And these are obviously people in the 1800s, and they're dragging their stuff across the plains. And uh, I looked at that, I said, oh, that's the Amish. I know these people. They don't they don't drive cars or anything. So I'm thinking, we're going to get there. And, and, you know, the reason we were moving was they were moving this – electronics manufacturing plant from San Jose, California to Utah. I thought, oh, I don't know how they're going to drive their buggies to work. You know, so th that's what I had in mind when I got there, there was like roads and churches and cars and like, okay, this is, this is normal. So, so I, I got them all wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a, in Iowa city, a couple of places in Iowa, you can go and see, they've actually like made little statues and you can walk some of the path that the Mormons took as they worked their way West, which yeah. is pretty cool considering all that Western I'm reading a book right now. Uh, it's about the, Com uh, the Comanches, I think yeah. the ones in Texas, brutal, brutal, brutal people, <laughs> brutal. And like, they like, they literally were the, the, like I was reading the first couple of chapters to see if I would, I would read it. And, uh, they talked about how they were rolling back Westward expansion. So anything yeah. that stops the manifest destiny is like, well, that's pretty, that's pretty special if you can do something like that. But right. um, so anything about like the, the old West and like how that happened is it's, it's a weird thing that like slowly stitch itself together in human history. Yeah. Well, yeah. you, you, you remarked on, you know, my ancestry going back to Jamestown. That was a shock to me because we, yeah. we grew up thinking we were just descendants of dirt farmers. And as I inherited my mother's genealogy file after she died, you know, I began pushing it back and I found on my father's side, you know, William Cantrell, was on the second resupply mission to Jamestown. Shocking to me, absolutely shocking. But as you study each of these people, you can see this path westward. And these were the early pioneers. And so for whatever reason, it's in my DNA to just go do stuff, right? And, and if you think about America as a whole, I don't care where anybody came from here, whether it's, whether it's Mexico or Europe or Africa or Asia, where, wherever you've come in from, we're all have, have something very much in common, which is very unique, which is, you know, our ancestors gave up this comfortable life where they were at, or maybe it wasn't so comfortable, but it was something they knew. And they went to a place where they had no idea how they're going to live, how they're going to make money. They didn't necessarily speak the language and they had no idea of knowing what it was like. And they get here and they're like, okay, God, here I am. Uh, let's go do this, right? And and it takes a special kind of person to do that. It takes a special kind of DNA, a special type of risk taking. And if people ask why America is different, this is why. It's because we have genetically self selected to risk takers coming here. And th this is why I'm very pro immigration, right? I'm not a political person, but I live 50 miles from the border and we get lots of Mexican immigrants. I wish they'd come here illegally. Right. I wish the system didn't forbid them to come, but we need this immigration. We need these people. We want these people. Right. This is this is the lifeblood of this country. People don't really realize it. And uh, I tell you, the closer you live to the border, the more you realize how hungry these people are and how grateful they are to come to a great place where there's so much opportunity. And so that's that's my really big sort of lesson from this westward expansion thing is. This is in our, you know, it, it wasn't just somebody said manifest destiny. Let's go get California. I mean, this is in our DNA. There's no stopping us, right? And to mm -hmm. go to Mars, this was an extension of that, right? It, it's yeah. it's it's not any different. We're gonna go. Yeah, I think the sometimes people do that what about what what aboutism thing where it's like, why should we do spend any money on that if we have like broken roads and stuff? It's like the innovation. <laughs> just if you look at it strictly from innovation, the innovation that we're gonna learn. And be applied on earth is going to be more than worth it and then you have that itch you have the people that like how carl sagan talks about what he, you you quote in this book too and carl sagan says it in the cosmos that there's these there's people that just need that have that itch they just want to explore and it's right. it's kind of a sad part about 
of the world now where it's like there's not that much left to explore you can explore it personally for yourself but there's a lot that's just like already mapped in it's kind of sad like i think that's i want to like visit alaska because there's like not that much known or like Am- the amazons <laughs> uh the amazon because like there's there's like so much there that you just don't know so that's kind of fun but you get the you get the benefit of like you get to explore the stars with, with your technology and stuff so your brain naturally gets to get to go there uh, yeah yeah i mean every every time the rover goes around the corner and photographs a new vista that's amazing you know when, when i was working on the mars balloon back in the in the 90s you know we, we had cameras that were going to go on that and i i spent so much time imagining what it would look like right what this thing would look like floating along the surface and because i was part of the team that designed the part of the the, the payload that drag along the ground i had to think about what the ground would look like right and so i spent a lot of time looking at images and all we had was viking images at the time of the surface of mars trying to imagine what these places were like so so the human imagination transports us there but now we're so lucky today to be able to see this to see these rover images i i I look at them today and i'm just i can spend an hour just looking at them because i i remember the days when we couldn't you know it was like the Mm -hmm. the you know not having the internet and and having to look at encyclopedias yeah i'm i'm really excited to see what the james Webb, webb comes out with just uh so far it's been really cool the images and then um, recently there was, I think there was a rover that shut down finally. It was like way overdue. Yeah. And they made like this post where it said, thank you for the <laughs> journey. Uh, yeah. And I, was, I almost like cried for the little rover. I was like, oh man, yeah. he's all alone out there. Uh, it was like, like this, it's kind of a weird thing. We anthropom- anthropomorphize things, but it's kind of fun too. I Let me tell you what. So we, those of us who build race cars, race race cars and are around race cars, we believe that you know, there's a part of your soul that somehow ends up in these machines. I can't explain it rationally, physically, but these machines all have personality. They really, truly do. And they're, they're okay, they're maybe not living things, but they sure as hell feel like it sometimes, right? And I have race cars that I'll say, ah, that one's got an evil spirit. We're going to sell that one. And I have some, it's like an old friend. I get into it and I feel like the arms are wrapped around me, you know? And some I'll get in, and I literally feel a physical meld with the with the vehicle when I'm on the track. It, it's it's a metaphysical thing that I can't quite explain to anybody that hasn't experienced it. And the fact that this this rover has a real personality, I'm sure if I talk to the guys who who lived with it day in and day out, you know, doing the the the, the path planning and the controlling and all that, I'm sure that they uh, I'm sure they would say the same thing that this definitely had its own quirks and personalities and. Health, the, the Iridium satellite network we we put up, you know, I was involved in that, and there were a hundred and some odd satellites. Each one of them had a different personality. Each and every one mm. of those satellites. It, it's it's an amazing fact. And and if you think about what what really happens with our um our, you know our creations, it's our own energy that goes into that. And you know, I don't want to get metaphysical or, re- or religious here, but. You know, where does that energy come from? Where does it go? And and does it does it really imprint on the machine? That's an interesting interesting thing to think about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if if the choice, if if we could have a choice, and I would want the energy to imprint, like if it was up to us, because then it adds something special. Like yeah. versus like, I mean, this is like if I could control reality, which I cannot. Um, then it's up to people's interpretation. But when when you get into the different cars, is it is it um. Is the personality geared to you or like if you had a kid get in or uh, some, one of your friends get in, would they feel the similar feeling? I mean, I guess assuming they were racers too, would they feel a similar feeling or does it, is it key to you, you specifically? <laughs> it's, that's a great question, actually. So sometimes, you know, I, I let a lot of people drive my cars and vice versa. And we often will do team driving. There are some cars that hate certain drivers, right? And they will always break for that driver. And so we say, look, you just bad luck with this car. Don't get in this car, right? But then most of the time, we all agree this is a great car, right? And it's it's got a sort of a feel to it, right? You know, we we, we sort of all can describe the the personality of the car, and you know, mm-hmm. it's 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 mild, but it's capable here, and it, you know, it, it, generally they 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 tend to be driver agnostic, but every now and then there's a like it's got to be the way that the driver drives it or something like that. It, it just, just doesn't work for them. I think the, that was another thing that I liked about this book and that you talked about your racing 
because the 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 elements in racing are very that you used to I think it was in the early part of the book you talked about when you were first getting into it the people can tell if you're actually serious or if you're just kind of you know someone with money or whatever just going around and it's a similar uh, that same concept is the same thing with space when you were looking at Elon and all the other people you could tell the difference I think sometimes people can't they only realize in hindsight that how things can be used in other places that's one of the things that um, I know many people when they like let's say look for a job they'll say well I don't have that experience so I can't do that it's like well do you have anything that's like that can you apply it differently because then um, that's kind of unique and you can do something different there so when you when you use like your childhood or racing and then you talk about space like it all shows how things kind of connect and you can use the similar skill set to assess things in a different way um, when it comes to racing the it, it did seem like it, it it took to you pretty quickly um where i think if i were to drive i'm a very defensive driver i got an accident one time i don't know if i liked it but at the same time i got a new i got a, a new car like uh i rented a car when i was in the bay area one uh, one day and i've never been to the bay area so i didn't know i okay this is stupid but i didn't know that it was very mountainous and so i was going as fast <laughs> as i could over the mountains and i was like this is kind of nice this is fun and i looked down i was like oh i'm, I'm going I'm not, it's been enough time. I was going like over a hundred. It's like, this is actually kind of fun. All the curves and stuff. Uh, right. So I, I can definitely see that fun in, in there. But um, can you talk about the, at the, at the same time, um, I don't know if we can talk about some of the things you've been going through lately, if you're going to be able to, to, to drive anymore. Um, Cause I know at some, at one point, if I'm like talking out of mouth, I'll, I'll cut this out. But uh, I know there was, there were some thoughts that you might be retiring from racing, but uh I think there's some good news in that maybe you won't, which would be great because I. Right. Yeah. Yes. No, okay, I so I, I got my racing license back Friday. So oh, uh, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had some, uh, had some heart problems that nobody knows where they came from. And locally here, you know, in, in Tucson, we're misdiagnosed. At one point, I was given six months to live and uh, I didn't believe them. Right. <clears throat> this is another part of my ethos is never give up. And, you, you know, you, you don't ever take somebody's prognostication as final. So I got, yeah. I got admitted to the Mayo Clinic and, and they, they said, no, it's, it's something different and this is eminently treatable. And yeah, I got my, I got my racing license back. So do my first race here in, in about a month and uh, it'll, it'll, it'll be a nice thing to get back to. Sweet. Yeah. Uh, where, where's it going to be? Well, where, uh, so locally, we have this um, track in uh, Wilcox, Arizona, which is about an hour away, that uh, was, uh, you know, built by a friend of mine. And uh, we, we have a SCCA race, which is the Sports Car Club of America. And I'm the regional executive for that here in Arizona. So this will be our uh, spring race. And uh, so I'll be, I'll be driving in it. How do you, this is, I joked about this before we started uh, talking about, I wanted to know how many speeding tickets you got, because the book talks like there's a there's a movie called American Graffiti that was I think by uh, uh, George Lucas and it, it talks it about his childhood which you know um, and it's like I, you know it's a different time I go like five miles I didn't get a ticket for it's like if you're five miles above they'll get you but if it's like a hundred <laughs> they seem to kind of maybe that's like why uh, I don't think you talked about speeding tickets but uh, you, you, no I got all I've gotten a lot of speeding tickets in my okay. life to answer your question but you know there's there's some it's it's interesting. It was a different time, right? Mm. And uh, back then, you know, one of the things I don't talk about is I used to make explosives because, you know, they they wouldn't throw you in jail for it. And uh, likewise, we you know we used to street race, and uh, you know we got caught once street racing. And we you know to be fair, we go out in the middle of nowhere and in, in outside of Logan, Utah, and, and set up a little street racing thing. And the only people that get hurt was us. And, you know, one time the cops showed up and they said, just go home. Just don't do this anymore. Right. It was that kind of environment. But, uh, you know, it, it, things have become you know, the society's become less tolerant of the risk that's posed by it, partially because the population density's gotten bigger, partially because the cars have gotten a lot faster. They, they You can now go down and buy a car that we used to struggle to build as a race car, like, uh, you know, these 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 uh, Dodge Challengers with the. The, the Hemi that's 800 horsepower, I mean, they'll do nine second quarter miles. And we had struggled to build those, you know, now you can just pay a hundred thousand dollars and buy one. But, you know, to, back to your question. Yeah. I've been pulled over a lot. Uh, a few of them I've gotten out of, I was, when I was uh, 17 years old, I was, I was arrested in the high school parking lot for having gone 85 in a 25 zone on the way to school. And then then exhibition of speed, which meant I was doing, 
uh, I was doing uh, uh, burnouts in the parking lot with a cop following me, and I didn't know he's behind me. So that was a nice start to my uh, driving career. And then, uh, you know, a few times since then, I've, I've gotten close to losing my license by having so many speeding tickets. One time in Utah, I had, I had this Maserati that I was driving, like you say, 100 miles an hour. I came up over this hill, about a buck twenty, and uh, the cop was coming the other way on the freeways, I-15. And he turned his rollers on. I just pulled over. You know, I thought I'm not going to try to outrun him. And uh, so he went down, came around back, and he pulled up behind me. So I thought I'd be a smart ass. And I gave him my racing license when he came up to the car. And he looked at it and he goes, All right. He goes, Funny. He says, Give me your real license. So I gave it to him and the registration. He went back to his car. He's back there for a few minutes. And he comes back and he goes, All right. He goes, I'm not going to ticket you. I'm going to give you a warning. He said, because clearly you know how to drive fast. Clearly this car can do this. And clearly this road's good enough for it. But the other people aren't. And he's, and then he said, he says, and don't ever do this on my road again. And I said, okay, yes, mm-hmm. sir. Thank you. And, and then he says, now off the record, he says, can I see your engine? <laughs> <laughs> so we went around and opened up the hood and he's like, unofficially, how fast have you had this car up to, you know? So he, he was, he was a big fan. So, so some of that sometimes happens, right? These guys are car guys and they understand, but yeah, I, since I've been racing, I, I kind of drive like grandma now on the, on the uh, roads and so, some of the drivers get annoyed by me. I, I drive so slow. Like today when I was out doing some stuff, uh, you know, this one driver was honking behind me and you know, I thought it was a lady and I thought, I wonder if she knows I'm a race car driver. <laughs> <laughs> she was a no, clearly annoyed I was driving too slow. Yeah, so you get it. It's like you get it out of your system, so then you can you know take your time when you're on the road. Well, it's it's you know I tell my kids this. I taught my kids all to race, and and uh, some some have stuck with it, some of them haven't. I got two that are racers. I say, look, don't do this shit on the street because you get killed, and uh, mm-hmm. or you'll get arrested, and things are bad. Just just go do it on the track, and it, it's it's you know, you're wearing proper safety equipment. Uh, I have, I had a car that I actually sold. It was so fast. It was an AMG GT and it was so fast on the track and I would don't go out just driving with a helmet, you know, that I realized that, that I was in pretty much mortal danger because the safety equipment wasn't adequate in a street car. Like we're, we're strapped in in a race car and I've got a roll cage around me. I've got a helmet on. I've got a head and neck device that keeps my head from moving around in case I get in a bad accident. I've got a fire system that, you know, if it catches on fire, I pull it and it fills up with foam or, or halon and so forth. So but you don't have that in a street car. So, so, you know, it just, suddenly I realized how vulnerable I was. So I sold the car. It's, it's just too fast for the street. Right. So, so that, that's kind of the, the ethos I have now is, you know, let's, let's keep it on the track where it's reasonably safe. And we don't lose that many people every year to racing. We, we really don't. I've seen some pretty horrific Rex, we we did a hill climb a couple of years ago. One of my friends, she drove off the edge and went down probably 500 feet down the cliff and rolled the car repeatedly. I'd built the cage for it, so I was happy it had survived, right? My welding was good enough and all that. So, uh, you know, but you, you see that over and over. People survive these tremendously horrific uh, car crashes they wouldn't in a, in a street car. Yeah. The, uh, is, there, is there a car or a type of car, like if you get like the chassis and build it out that you're looking for, or that is there, are there some that like, no matter what, if you saw it, you would like, I'm going to get that home so I can work on it. So I, like just in terms of like rebuilding it, is there like, a, so there's like two questions. Is there a white whale out there that you've been hunting and then, or is there just like something that you, you would always want to grab and work on? <laughs> the cars, the race cars for me have been more uh, like straight cats that show up on my doorstep mm-hmm. and, uh, the, the, the owners typically beg me to borrow buy them, uh, I, particularly the Corvettes. For some reason, I'm known as a Corvette racer, and uh, I've had two Corvettes that have shown up where the, the owners found me. And they said, "You need to buy this race car." And I'm like, "I need another car like a hole in the head." And then before long, I get talked into it because the price comes down and the you know it starts to look attractive. And then like one of them, I call it Trash Wagon. I you know the Trash Wagon and I have done several championship drives and have done very well we got six nationally and gt1 in it you know but it's a it's a crappy old 30 year old car and there's no business being out there with these million dollar trans am cars i was competing against you know but but it was a straight straight cat you know and 
Mm. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I don't really pine for anything. I am building my own of my own design right now. Like it's a prototype car, like they race in Le Mans. And, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of sort of the dev- design phase of that, although the frame is probably going to get started here pretty soon. But, uh, that, that one, I just always want to build my own car from the ground up. And that'll be my first. Is there, is there like a look? That you, uh, I don't know if you can tell us anything about it. If it's like secret, but is there like no. a is there like a look that you're designing it off of? So yeah, I mean this is a rear engine car, mid engine, whatever you want to call it, um, closed cockpit because I uh, I saw you know one of my compatriots get their head taken off at Las Vegas in an open open cockpit car when his when his Indy car went into the fence, you know, and so that that left an impression with me. But uh, apart from that, I want it. I want it to be sort of sexy, like the uh, like the '60s Ferrari uh, Le Mans cars. And mm. the the problem is the aerodynamics don't want you to do that, right? So pure performance says to go with you know some of these more stark lines and so forth. So I'm still in the phase of designing the body, right? I, I know I've got the frame designed and and the suspension, and I'm I'm going through a choice of engines and so forth right now, but but we're designing it so that we can win a 24 hour race. And uh, so, so with that in mind, there's some, some practicality. So I'm going to have to face, if I make this whole thing out of aluminum, that's less practical than fiberglass where I can carry spare body parts in case somebody hits us and so on. So, so I'm going to have to make that choice between beauty or function. Right. And, and I'm not sure where that's going to be yet. Hmm. You could have, I don't know how much time you wanted to put into it. You could have two. You could have one that's just like straight beautiful and then one that is like straight, you know, functional. <laughs> I, have so many cars, I don't win. know what to do with them right now. That's my <laughs> problem. Yeah. I've been uh, I've been selling a bunch of them off, but I'm, I am think I'm down to 20 now. So I, I need to stop buying more cars. Yeah. How, how do you uh, train for like, because you have everything going on. How, how have you been training for the, the race that's going to be up in the next month? I, you know, it's like riding a bicycle, you never forget it. So, but it is true that more seat time you have, the better you are. So I don't expect necessarily to be at my stellar best because I don't have time to go out, but I've got a month. I'll, I'll go out and do some, get some, some more driving on the, on the car and just get used to it again. Cause I've been in the car for about a year, but uh, yeah. you know, when I go to new tracks, that that's where things get real interesting because they, this is a track I know I've driven it thousands of laps and, and, you know, there's like this muscle memory. It comes back to you very, very quickly, but new tracks, you don't know. So I use a uh, online simulator. So it's called iRacing and I have this gigantic, again, everything's out of control. You know, it's like tools. I've got this gigantic uh, seat in my, in my garage with a big screen TV and a computer and, and uh, the, the wheel and all the, the pedals and everything. And, so you can go select all these racetracks around mm-hmm. the world and they've done a great job at scanning them and, and putting a lot of fidelity into them and a lot of fidelity into the physical models of the cars. So you can select different kinds of cars and so on. And so I find that to be about like an 80% uh, useful way to learn a new track. And, uh, you know, when you get there, though, you got to go, you got to do the practice day, which is no- normally people use that to, to uh, make sure their car doesn't break. Fortunately, I've got this this track locally here, and I'm a member of it, so I can use it anytime I want. So we we tend to use that for you know making sure the car's sorted and so on. So I can focus on learning the track when I get get there. And uh, the first time I drove Road America up in uh, Wisconsin uh, during a championship, it was in the in the heavy heavy rain. You know, it was wrath of God rain, and uh, it was a practice run. And and fortunately, I'd done you know, probably 500 laps in the simulator. And, and so I, I, I rather knew it, you know, so it was, it was, it was good, but you know, the dynamics are always different. You know, the computer can only do so much to simulate the real feel of it. It gets close, but not, it's not really there. Are you able to uh, update the computer with statistics and information from your car that you're building so that you can train on it as well? Or is it like, just like not capable of doing that? Yeah, no. So, so fortunately, Trash Wagon uh, was owned by the father of, of the vice president of iRacing. So their very first physical model was based on my car. <laughs> so if you mm-hmm. get in, if you choose the Corvette in, in iRacing, that, that's based on the suspension in, in Trash Wagon, my car. So that one felt very familiar to me, by the way. 
but to, to have a new one, you, you have to either find something similar or have them put, put that model together, but they don't normally do that. Right. Mm -hmm. Those guys have come to me and said, Hey, we want to do a model of this car and we don't know the owner, but you do. Can you introduce us? You know, so I've done some of that. Right. But these are historic cars that, you know, that, that they want to get the, get, they, they got to go in and measure all the parameters and they, they scan it. It's, it's a whole big effort. You know, they have to uh, understand what the suspension geometry is and weigh, weigh it and all this other stuff. So it's, it's quite, quite involved. Are, what are your, um, what are your goals for racing going to be for this year, <laughs> just in general? Just to have fun. It, it's, hmm. you know, for me, it's one of the reasons I'm, I try to stay healthy and, uh, you know, it's just, I, I love it so much. It's, it's like loving life. So I, I, I just want to get back into it this year. We're going to do a couple of historic races and, you know, I just want to, uh, want to get out there and, and, and run. Sweet. Do you, um, is there any AI or machine learning that is used in race? I know there's some stuff that's been applied more to space stuff, but I don't know if it's used in racing other than maybe like mathematical models, like how to optimize a road yeah. or something. Yeah, it's starting to, um, there, there's all group by the way that, uh, has uh, these autonomous race cars that they're working on and they're getting pretty good. Right. And so I've, I've spoken with a number of those guys. So that's probably where the, the big part is, but you know, I, I think that's further taking away the interest of racing. I don't know how mm. popular that I'll ever get, but I do believe it is a good way to, um, to develop the technology of self-driving vehicles. But uh, yeah, you know, as far as the vehicle design and that it's still pretty old school. It's a, it's a surprisingly, conservative industry um we don't like to use things that haven't been proven and uh you know ai is still a little still a little out there uh, there's probably some guys in formula one that are using it where they've got enough money to do that but i've i've done some work for some of the formula one teams some engineering work and, and i found them to be very cheap very uh very cost conscious people so i kind of i have my doubts to how much they're applying there yet and then um uh I'm trying to like pick our things because I think I, I let the time get away from us and I want to be respectful of your time. The, um, what, uh, what other than the book that you're writing now, is there any books that you recommend? I see some behind you that people read. <laughs> well, I, I like to read about uh, weapons programs. So that's not necessarily <laughs> something I recommend. I, I, I love, I love reading history, but there's a couple of books that I'll, I'll recommend in general. One of them will be surprising. It's called illusions by Richard Bach. And uh, he wrote Jonathan Livingston Seagull back in the 70s. Illusions was the story of a uh, reluctant messiah, uh, this guy named Don Shimoda, who was strangely a mechanic, and he had these messianic powers, and he could fix anything, including people's lives. And pretty soon people flocked to his garage, and he couldn't get anything done. And so he said, I quit. He said, I'm, I'm no longer the messiah. They said, you can't quit. He said, watch me. So he got in his plane, he flew off, and it's the story of, how he meets this other this other guy and they're they're barnstorming in the 20s and 30s from field to field and giving rides to the farmers and the locals in, in the in the summer and and uh, it's 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 a it's a philosophical book about you know how to live life and and how to deal with life's problems and challenges and so forth. This is a great book. I I have to go back and read it every now and then. Then the next one is the art of racing in the rain. Um, which is Garth Stein. And you'll find I use that qu quotes from him a lot. Uh, he's a racer and he wrote this story, however, about uh, this racer named Denny who, who has a, uh, uh, a custody battle over his daughter after his wife dies. And it's, it's a very heartwarming story and it's told by a dog. So it's, uh, and, and again, you'll, you'll, I don't want to ruin the story, but the dog has a special place in the, in the end of the story, but uh, yeah, it's a, gr a great book. Hmm. I'm gonna. I'll check out both. Uh, I'm, as you can tell, I, I like to read. And this shelf over here is yeah. pretty empty, so I need to fill <laughs> okay. it up. Okay, uh, room. <laughs> is there a the you, you, you? I think you have a website, but is there a good way to stay up to date with what you're working on? Is there? There's not like one spot that people can generally just be like, "Hey, you know, Jim's doing this, this, and this." Well, JimCantrell.com. You know, I do keep the blog there, and I'm not as often as I want to. But best place to keep track of me is actually Twitter. And it's uh, James N. Cantrell. It's my Twitter Sweet. handle. And I'm verified. <laughs> yeah. It's just the, you're, you're supporting Elon Musk. 
Hey, I think what he's doing with Twitter is great. I, I, I think yeah. what they were doing was wrong. I actually knew most of the people that got fired, uh, most of the Twitter executives. Yeah, so what they were doing was wrong. Yeah, it's uh the the leader people, the CEO, the the former Back. CEO. They got they didn't oh, yeah. they didn't they were like obnoxious little shits, and then they got like a like forty million dollar payday, and it's like they did man, fine. I don't know fail fail failure way to the top. I guess I don't know. Yeah, because so the, I thought the, what I was reading, they they it, what, once again, this is just what I read on um, stuff. But I was reading that they were um, they they were like obfuscating when they were working with with Elon on the takeover, and then um, they were like making it so that they seemed bigger than they were. I don't know to the extent that that's real or not. Well, they so I won't use names, but uh, many of them whom I knew personally because they invested in one of my prior companies. Um, they had a secret relationship with the government of the United States mm-hmm. to provide data. And if you think about it, it really comes down to this. So the, the, the U S government with all its ability to spy on any individual in the world is forbidden by law to spy on American citizens, unless they're working with a foreigner that's under surveillance. Right. But what that, that's the fourth amendment of the constitution against unreasonable search and seizure that prevents them from doing that. But if you sign a, an agreement, a user agreement with Twitter or Facebook or any of these social media joints that says, oh, yeah, uh, you're free to share my data with third parties. It doesn't say except the NSA, except the DOD, except mm. the CIA. It doesn't, doesn't say any of that. So Homeland Security, all these guys saw this as a way around the Fourth Amendment limitation to keep track of what people were saying and doing because governments naturally tend towards thinking of the people as the enemies because they get in the way of governments. Governments are all about self-preservation and funding themselves. And we, the people, uh, j- just like in some of the movies, are the energy source that keeps them alive. And uh, so this this is uh, this is what happened. And, and Twitter got corrupted by the easy money that was offered by the intelligence agencies. And it was just wrong all the way across the board. And I don't think that the Twitter executives were bad. But they had a challenge, and, and and I knew Jack. I met Jack a few times, and you know he didn't know how to make money on this. He he asked me one time at dinner. He says, how, how, "What do you think I should do a Twitter?" And I said, "I don't know. Advertising. Do do anything that keeps it alive because I think it's great a great place for a a you know a community conversation, right?" And I don't think they understood how to make that happen. I don't think Elon understands how to make that happen. That's just going to be his next hat trick, is how to do that. So so hopefully he can. Uh, and and I think that the others will do just fine in life, and they'll go on to the next big thing. But it was mm-hmm. it was amazing to me to how many former FBI people worked at Twitter. It, it you know it just shows how corrupt the FBI has become. Yeah, I think Apple had a similar situation where the FBI wanted like a backdoor on something, and they I think they told them like step off, which is you know. Um, yeah. yeah, Apple was always sort of the anti-establishment hippie. Uh, sort of alternative, right? I, I'm a big Apple guy now, not because of that, but I just think their products are better. But they, of all the companies, have have not really given in to the government, best I can tell. And uh, Microsoft has, and they offered backdoors. You know, this whole this whole uh, uh, Amazon Web Server is the same thing, right? They're, the government's mm-hmm. all over that stuff. So, you, you know, in this day and age, me personally, I'm a civil libertarian, but I've decided that anything I do online is going to be visible to everybody. So I just better better treat it that way yeah and then uh okay so then let, let i guess uh, it's a good time to do the outro there's other questions but i know i'm like i, I think i've gone long <laughs> so like, yeah, I'm gonna stop. Need to go eat. <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 i was like i looked at the time like 10 minutes ago i was like Shh, crap uh but so um so everybody this is jim control uh all the stuff's gonna be in the show notes uh his book will be up soon and that'll be in the show notes as well you should check it out I, i'm not joking it's really really good so jim thanks for coming back on the show and this was the the show. I'm not good at these outros yet, but I'm doing this a new thing. Thank you all. You're you're very kind about my book. I really appreciate it. It was a work of love, and I, I I'm really pleased to hear that you liked it. Yeah, and I anyone who reads it and doesn't like it, you let me know. Uh, but I think you, <laughs> give it give it like a couple chapters. You're gonna enjoy it. So. <laughs>